I want to bring a message tonight, hopefully it will be a message of encouragement to Matthew chapter 3 and um, verse number 1. We're going to start at verse number 1. Is everybody there? Say amen. amen. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Boy, I'd like to heard him preach. Man, I ain't kidding you. I'd like to heard him preach. It's amazing to me that these folks went out to him in the wilderness. And here's what he preached. And saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him, listen to this, just think about this. Then went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan. And they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now here's a guy, they ain't even got a church house. And he starts preaching out there in the woods, in the, well, in the wilderness, the desert area, was all called the wilderness. And I mean, people starts coming out of the towns to hear this man preach. Jerusalem, come out of the, the Judea. Do you realize what a geographical area that is in the regions around Jordan? Verse number seven says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, all of a sudden the religious, somebody didn't show up at church said, where was y'all? We went down to John the Baptist outdoor service this morning. (laughs) So the preachers all decided to go down and see what's going on. And they came down there and this is wild. What generation of vipers. That's a nice welcome, wasn't it? Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now folks, that's tough preaching. That's taking the bark off the tree. How'd you like to walk into a church service and the preacher look at you and say, you viper, who warned you to flee from the right to come? That don't fit our uh, idea of preaching these days, does it? I know Joel Osteen preaches like that, but not anybody else that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, should I? That's me. Verse number eight, he says this, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. That's pretty powerful God that can make people out of stones. You know what he was declaring to him? The power of his God. And now also the ax is laid into the root of the trees. Therefore, every fruit which bringeth not forth, every tree which bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And by the way, we're needing that in this day. Amen. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. I want to preach a message tonight entitled Strange Preachers. Strange Preachers. John the Baptist was a strange preacher. He had a strange message. Repent or you're going to die and go to hell. Who, I mean, that, that's strange preaching. Has anybody ever walked into a service and a, a preacher jumped up and said, you vipers, what are you doing here? Who warned you to flee from the right? I called you a snake. A bunch of snakes showed up and especially all the other preachers. You know what most people say? That's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. Can you believe how he talked to those visiting pastors? That's strange. That's different. That ain't normal. That ain't the normal preaching you hear. He's a strange, he had a strange message. He he, he had a strange pulpit. I I don't know. It's somewhere out there in the open air. Probably jumped up on a rock or a stump somewhere. And by the way, can I tell you that America spiritual foundation was also based on a lot of men who preached open air who went out in the fields and preached. John Whitfield, one of the greatest evangelists America ever had here. He was from England, but he came here. Uh, they put him out of the, of the denomination and he and John Wesley both kicked him out and they told the people, if you'll come out in the field, we'll preach to you out here. And they did by the tens of thousands. I have read the account of George Whitfield holding meetings in, in areas and they said the wagons would begin to roll by days ahead of time of the announced meetings and the dust would never settle because of the people walking and riding wagons going to his meetings. And he preached to as many as 20,000 people without a microphone. 
churches were start. You want you drive through America and you wonder why there's a church here and a church there and a church there. It was done by people who were awakened to true spiritual rebirth in those days by open air preachers and who didn't have a normal message. And if you've ever read any of George Whitfield messages, brother, I'm going to tell you something. He would take the hide off of you. And, uh, but he preached with the love and compassion of God. He wanted people to be saved and he knew they didn't need to be played with. He knew their souls did not need to be played with. Strange preacher. It was a strange location out in the wilderness. He didn't say, send me $500. Some of you can send 2000. We're trying to build a church up here. And then we're going to have, then I'm going to start preaching. He didn't wait to have a building. Amazes me how many people act like they can't have church till they have a building. Buildings are nice. He also was a strange preacher in the way that he dressed. Camel's hair. Camel's hair is rough. Didn't wear a suit and a tie. Didn't have on fine clothing. Didn't have on the, the false prophet and the priest's garments and try to look like somebody in town. He, had a, he, had a, he wore a belt, a leather and girdle, the Bible says. That's a leather belt. I figure he had on a great big old belt. And if they would have had him, he'd have had a 357 mag stuck back here. He probably had a good knife. I like to see men wear belts. If you don't wear a belt, I'll think you're wearing slacks. <laughs> hey man, I'm just being a little on right now. It's all right. Hold on to your seat and you know, tighten down. It's okay. But I'll tell you something about John the Baptist. Nobody had to wonder whether he is a man or not. Hey Amen. And then he had a strange menu. He ate, lo- he ate locusts. Can you imagine that guy picking up a grasshopper and eating one end, taking a bite off one end and throwing the rest of it in his mouth, crunching it down? He ate locust, which is a type of locust is just a big old, big old heavy duty grasshopper. <coughs> Have you ever seen a locust? They're about like your big finger right here. Big old, got great big old head on it. Can you imagine him? I don't know whether he fried them, boiled them. I don't know whether he ate them. I don't know how he ate them, but he ate locusts. That's what the Bible says. That's what he did. Had a strange appetite and wild honey. And he probably took that wild honey, dipped them locusts down that honey. Arf. Amen. Strange preacher. Amen. God had some strange preachers. Can I tell you something? You'll find out in the Bible that it was the strange preachers that got people's attention that God used to wake people up. And I want to give you tonight just a few of the strange preachers that God gives. Uh, God never tries to fit into the religious mold. Never did, never will. God never, ever, you study history out, God never tried to fit, fit, fit his preachers into the mold of the religious system that was going on in that time. I want to give you about, I don't know how many I got. I'm going to give you some strange preachers. You ought to write these down. The first strange preacher I want to tell you God had was Noah's dove. God has some strange preachers in the Bible. But in Genesis chapter 8, verse 11, it says, And the dove came unto him, Noah, in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf, plucked off. So Noah, listen to me, knew that the waters were abated off the earth. God sent some strange preachers like Noah's dove. You know what's the message of? That dove had a message to Noah. It told Noah that God is faithful to do exactly what he said he would do. God had told Noah, build that ark, get in that ark, and I'll take you through this thing. I'll save you from this flood, and I'll save you from destruction. I'll bring you out on the other side. And did you know what that, when that dove came in, had that green olive leaf plucked off, dropped it in there? God, I believe old Noah said, hallelujah, God sent me a preacher to remind me of his faithfulness. And every once in a while in your life, God will send something along to remind you of God's faithfulness in your life. I'm telling you something, God is faithful, amen. The Bible said God is faithful. And you know why God wants to send you a preacher about God's faithfulness is because the devil will try to tell you that God is not going to come through. That, no, that dove was a faithful preacher. You know, the dove's a picture of the Holy Ghost and every once in a while the dove will light on you if you let him. I had a man talk to me the other day. Listen to me. man talked to me the other day and he started weeping. He said, Reggie, I was in the Korea War and he said, I thank God I came back safe and sound. But he said, Reggie, I never, no, no, I'm sorry. Vietnam War, Vietnam War. I've, I've, I've talked to so many people this week. I forget where all wars is at. But anyway, this guy's in Vietnam. He said, Reggie, I landed in Vietnam. And he said, this is no truth. He said, I got saved over here in, in Texas County when I was a 12 year old boy. He said, I'm telling you the truth. I never hardly left Texas County the whole time I was growing up and went to school. He said, and all of a sudden here I am, ain't hardly been out of Texas County. And next thing I know, I'm on a plane to Vietnam. He said, that's a pretty big move for a country boy. He said, Reggie, I'm not going to lie to you. I had trembling and fear in my heart because I could hear the radio like everybody else. There's a lot of boys wasn't coming home. He said, I didn't know where I'd be. And I could just imagine the jungles and some bomb going off or getting sabotaged or ambushed or whatever. 
And he said, Reggie, you never will forget. He said, I come off that plane and my feet was going to touch and hit that Vietnamese soil. And he said, Reggie, as God is my witness, he said, it sounded and felt like a dove's wing on this left shoulder. He said, Reggie, it was just like a flutter. And he said, Reggie, a still, small, unheard voice by anybody else said, I'm going to take you in here and I'm going to take you out alive. And he said, Reggie, all these years later, 2016, he said, I've certainly, he said, I, and he started weeping and crying. He said, Reggie, you may not believe that. You may, I said, I believe it and I understand it. He said, you may not understand that, but he said, God whispered by the dove to me, I'm going to take you back to Texas County, Missouri. You're going to make it through. You listen to me. God will send you a dove every once in a while if you listen to him good. If you get quieted down enough, you'll seek his face and get in tune with God. I'm telling you something. I've had the dove flutter over my soul. I've had God, I just had yesterday, I just had this morning. About eight o'clock this morning, God whispered sweet peace to my heart. I'd been praying. I'm telling you what, I've been crying out to God. I'd been seeking the Lord's face. And this morning, about eight o'clock, God said to me, The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. And God gives sweet peace to me. I am telling you, God's got a preacher. You know what that message of faithfulness is? Number one, you listen to me. God never lies to nobody, never has, doesn't, and never will. What he has said, he will do. Amen. God doesn't lie. Can I tell you further? God never forgets you. God never forgets you. Don't let the devil tell you God forgets you, that, that God will forget you. He will not forget you. He said, can, he said can, a mother may for, for, forget her suckling child, but he said, I will never forget thee. The Bible said that he'll never leave us. You listen to me. God has promised. Hey, look up here at me this morning. Look up tonight. Look up here. God will never leave you. You listen to me, there's a message of faithfulness in the dove that God will never leave you. The devil's going to tell some of you, God's left you, God's left you. You've sinned too bad. You went too far. It's it's too rough for God. God will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a message of faithfulness tonight. I kind of wish I was at a camp meeting tonight. Uh, I'll tell you something. Boy, I'll tell you what. Give me, I need to go get, I need to go win a few blacks to the Lord and get him in here. Amen. I need to get that old boy over Hartville. I never will forget him. He stuck that leg out there. Hey, man! <laughs> Yowzer! I want to tell you something. God never fails you. The devil will try to make it look like God has failed you. He has not failed you. God cannot fail you, and he will not fail you. It's a message of faithfulness. He, the Bible said he will be our guide even unto death. And I'm going to tell you something. That dove came down. God's letting you know. Now listen, it's a message. God wants you to have a message in your life day by day of the faithfulness of God. Because that is where Satan is going to attack you. That God is not being faithful to his promises. God said he would take him through the other side. And he did. He told Moses, you go down and get them people. I'm going to lead them into Canaan land. And he did. God has, you can go all the way through the Bible. And God said he would do this. And God did that. Jesus said he's coming again. He's coming again. He said, he, he said he's going to whoop the whole world's armies at the Valley of Armageddon. He is going to whoop the whole world's armies. He said he'd make Israel the head of the nations. He will make Israel the head of the nations. I'm telling you, everything God has ever promised, everything God's ever said, He will do it, and we need to be reminded of the message of God's faithfulness to us. That old dove was a type of the Holy Ghost, that olive leaf. And can I say to you, he brought an olive leaf in his mouth, and that speaks of peace, and it speaks of promise that God has given us. God is faithful. How many say God is faithful? You ought to just stop right now and say, Lord, raise your hand to heaven and say, God, I believe you're faithful. I ain't going to believe the devil's lies no more. Uh, God, I believe you're faithful. Second strange preacher, I got to go. This could last till the morning breaks, sun breaks. The second great preacher in the Bible is Balaam's donkey. The second preacher is ba- strange preacher is Balaam's donkey. In Numbers 22, 28, that old donkey talked at him and he told him some things. And you can read the story about yourself. But you know what that message was? Now listen to me good tonight. It was a message of rebuke. It was a message of rebuke. It was God's effort to head off stupidity and foolishness. Sometimes God's going to send you a message. Hey, Dodo, wake up. You're fixing to walk into a trap. You're fixing to do something stupid that's going to hurt your life and hurt your family. Hey, Dodo, wake up. That donkey turned around and he just as well said, hey, Dodo, wake up. You know what was going on? There was an angel with a sword drawn was going to kill Balaam for his disobedience to God. That donkey crushed his foot and that donkey wouldn't go and he kept thought and finally Balaam started beating the donkey and beating him to the ground he was beating the very messenger watch me now he was beating the very messenger that God was using to save his life the Bible says this that rebuke enters into the heart of a wise man more than a hundred stripes into the back of a fool 
God's saying you can line you over a pole and put a hundred lashes across your back. He said a rebuke will enter into a wise man more than that will enter a fool. You think about that. So let me tell you something. When your daddy rebukes you and says, I want to tell you something right now that ain't going on in this house. Don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. When the preacher jumps up and he's preaching on something and you wonder, how'd he know that? That's just God telling you that God knows and he sent a donkey to talk to you. You go out of the church house and in your mind beat that preacher over the head. Or maybe you got a Sunday school teacher or a brother in the Lord or a grandpa or a brother and sister trying to head you off. Don't be stupid. Don't be foolish. God will send you messages of rebuke. I am not going to put up with this much longer. I'm telling you, it's a wonderful thing to have reproof. The Bible said that a preacher is to reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. Did you know what part of my job is? Is jump up here and rebuke and reprove against sin and wrongdoing. And if you say, well, I don't like that part of it. I don't either. I wish I could get up here and pour honey all over you angels every Sunday morning. <laughs> but that ain't job of preaching. Correction. Instruction in righteousness. I want to tell you something. You can ask my wife. I find the hardest, toughest, roughest preaching that I can find in America around the world. And if I'm going to listen to preaching, I want somebody that, I mean, plow my field up. That's what I want. Did you know what? If you, you, ought to, you ought to rejoice when a preacher rebukes and reproves. John the Baptist was a strange preacher because he didn't put up with a lot of nonsense and he reproved and he rebuked. Now you need to do it in love. In fact, man alive, I ain't near as tough as John the Baptist. I'm much more loving, compassionate, and kind, aren't I? Say amen right there, Sam. Ain't that the truth? I'm just saying to you, listen. That old Balaam's donkey was a message of rebuke. And if you and I, the Bible said, rebuke and reprove with all long suffering and doctrine. Learn to appreciate and hear rebuke. You know what? I have thought, man, I'm thinking right now about my daddy one time. But Bob, I was fixing to make a decision. And I went down to my dad's and walked in the milk barn. No intention of talking to him about it. And he brought up the subject. And he just simply said, son, I sure hate to see you do that. But I done had my head made my mind that that's what I was going to do. And Brother Larry, I didn't listen to my dad's reproof. It cost me the most of anything that's ever cost me in my life because I did not pay attention to my dad's reproof. I couldn't tell you the times. Of, that's been one of my great faults in life is I'm stubborn as a I don't know what. And if I get it in my head, I'm going to do something. It's going to be, there's going to be a foot crushing just like Balaam because I ain't got enough sense. And God has to send rebukes and God has to send reproofs. But you know what? I have got to a point in life I'm thankful for. It. I really have. It may take me a day or two. God knocks me upside the head, does something, gets my attention. But I'm saying this, strange preacher, huh? Balaam's donkey, Noah's dove. Third one is Elijah's ravens. Strange preacher. But you know what? They had a message. The Bible said, and the ravens brought bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. Now, I've got a vivid imagination. Oh, I've got an imagination. I'm seeing this little Israelite Jewish woman baking bread in that old time oven. And she's got that beautiful brown loaves of bread. And she's taking some old Jersey cow. I suppose they had Jersey cows. And she's a butter on the top of that bread. And man, you could smell that bread a half a mile away. She's a pulling it out of the oven. And then she sets it up in the window for it to cool off a little bit. And all of a sudden, ah! Here comes an old raven down, grabs it up by the beacon claws, and flies off with a loaf of her bread. Flies over the hills and over the hollers and comes down on the brook. Flies over Elijah, drops over on a rock, and old loaf of bread rolls off. And Elijah says, thank you, preacher. You just reminded me of God's provision. It brought me a message that God will provide all my needs according to his riches and glory. Those ravens are a message of God's provision for you. He said, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Oh, I get to thinking about another old raven. He is a flying over there on Peter's. That wasn't Peter's fishing boat, but probably somebody about like him. And they just brought up some fish in it and dumped them out on the deck of that boat. 
And here comes an old raven in, maybe two of them, and reach down and grab a great big old bass. That's my imagination. I don't know whether they got bass over there or not. And holds that in his claw, flies over the mountaintop, comes down over to Elijah. And Elijah looks up. But, I call him a buzzer or a raven, whatever you want to call Comes there and drops down and says, special delivery from God. Elijah clicks up a little, far, little old campfire there and puts him a couple, three rocks together. I'll tell you what, we got fish and homemade bread. Hallelujah, God take care of you, amen. You need to understand tonight. I, listen, God is not the government. I, I'll tell you what, I'm almost looking forward to the day when the treasury looks up and says we're out of paper to print money and it ain't worth nothing anyway and we can't send out the social security checks. Yeah. You say, oh. <laughs> no. I, let me tell you something. I'll just inject this. I think you, well, every dime you've paid in, you ought to get back. But can I tell you something? If you're depending on government to take care of you, someday some of your grandchildren is not going to get the check in the mail. Are you listening to me? Someday. They're not going to get the check in the mail. And the government, you're going to find out the government is not God and they can't send bread and fish down to you, but God can do it, amen. That's a message that you better get. Put your trust in the Lord and not in princes, the Bible said. Oh, I lost some of you on that social security deal. (laughs) I listen to me, I'm 62 years old and I'm fixing to get there. I'm going to take mine. You know why? Because I paid it in. And I'm not against Social Security, I'm not. But what I am against is creating a dependence that government can never provide and shouldn't provide. Let me tell you something. There's a message in this. I want to tell you something now. Elijah couldn't call the government and say, hey, where's my check? Could he? Can I tell you something? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things be added unto you. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have not seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. God will take care of you. Well, I've really lost some of you. Some of you look like you just lost your last cat. <laughs> some of you are going to go all over the country tomorrow and text and Facebook. Reggie Kelly preached last night. That, you know, um. <laughs> if I find out you do that, <laughs> Elijah's ravens. I'll take God saying to him, I'll take care of you, Elijah. Elijah was smack in the center of the will of God. Faithfulness. I'll take care of you, Elijah. I, I'm, listen, I'm going on being silly tonight, but I'm going to be honest with you. I want you to know something tonight. Noah does said a message of God's faithfulness. Elijah's raven said, I'm going to take care of you. Balaam's donkey said, do right. Or I have to straighten you out. There are messages. Well, here's another strange preacher in the Bible. Them old dogs that came and licked Lazarus' sores. I like this strange preacher, and I'm going to tell you why. Now, it is no wonder to me that across the world you hear this statement, dog is man's best friend. Now, it's a lie. It's not true. Right? A dog is not your best friend. Jesus is your best friend. I have figured out what business a person ought to be in. That's the dog food business. Because they're everywhere. There's more dogs in the county than there is kids. Yeah. There's two in the house and three in the yard. And they've got to be fed. I like dogs. But I'm going to tell you there's a specialness about this. Now listen, here's a homeless man. Are you listening to me? Here's a man in bad shape. He had sores, running, running sores. And he's sitting at the gate of the rich man nobody caring about him. Them dogs is God's preacher in the Bible telling you of God's compassion for you. It's a message of compassion. When we sing that song, God will take care of you, God means it. When he says, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Now you listen to me tonight. A lot of things in this world I don't understand. I don't understand why God would allow babies to be butchered in the womb. I don't understand it. Just going to be honest with you. I don't understand why God would allow three guys shoot a girl down here in Arkansas today or Wednesday working at a Sonic just bringing food out to him. Shot her six times because they didn't like the way she brought the food to him. I don't understand why God would allow five policemen to be shot down there by a bunch of sorry, low down, worthless cowards. 
I don't understand why God allows some five-year-old girl to be raped up in Twin Falls, Idaho here recently. But down in my heart, I know someday God's going to set it all right. And that God is a compassionate God. I want you to take your Bibles to Psalms 103. I want you to let the rich man's dogs preach to you. Psalms 103. Let's begin at verse number 8. I want to ask you a question tonight. How many of you have been treated worse than a dog by people? Did you know what I've observed? Is that people will treat people worse than they do dogs. They'll do things to people they have never done to a dog. So there's something to this. Those dogs is God's preacher. By the way, this ain't the only place in the Bible where dogs were God's preacher. When Ahab and Jezebel had Naboth killed, God had some dogs that did some pretty rough preaching. Oh, oh, oh Elijah told Ahab, he said, the dogs are going to lick your blood at the pool. Jezebel, dogs are going to eat your flesh, Jezreel. And I'll tell you what I'm like, old brother. I'm telling you right now, every time a dog howled at night, I believe Ahab jumped. I believe Jezebel sleeping in on her silk and satin sheets and a howl. I believe she jumped. Those dogs is a preaching at her. And I'm telling you, but this dog... These dogs were dogs of compassion. Verse number eight, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. You better latch on to that verse. You're going to need it someday. Because you're going to think his mercy is clean gone. He just can't do no more for you. Verse number nine, he will not always chide. Neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. You know why? Because he dealt with Christ on the cross. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remember. That we are dust. I'm going to tell you something. I don't know why that man had to lay at the gate with sores running, begging. But I do know that I read the end of the story that he died and the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. And I remember reading where the rich man was in hell and lifted up his eyes being in torments and said, send Lazarus to warn my brothers. Which side of the situation would you rather be on tonight? The side of Lazarus or the side of the rich man? You know what's funny about us American Christians? We'll talk about old Lazarus going to heaven, but we want to live like the rich man. You listen to me. God is a God of compassion tonight. You know who wrote this song? You know who said these things? I was listening this afternoon to my Bible on the, radio, on the CD players I laid and took the nap. And I was listening to Alexander Scorby reading where David saw Bathsheba. She was beautiful to look upon. Sent, inquired, took her. Committed adultery on one of his own soldiers. Then he had the message that she was conceived a child and he called him in from the battlefield and lied to him like a dog. Tried to get him to go be with his wife, cover his sin up. Then when that didn't work, made him drunk, tried to get him to go down to his house. And that didn't work, Brother Phil. He wrote a letter, 
watch this, to Joab, the general of the army, and sent it by the hand of Uriah and made him carry his own death sentence. The Bible goes ahead to tell about went on. One day old prophet Nathan came. Nathan began telling that story about one man that had these great flocks, had all these sheep, had everything he could ever want. He said he had a neighbor, had one little old ewe lamb. He said he loved her, ate out of his own hand. He said, then the stranger came by and said, that rich man wouldn't take out of his own big flocks. He went down and got that poor man's little ewe lamb, killed it. And old David's veins swelled up. He got mad, the Bible says. He got angry. David said before, he could, before Nathan hardly got the words out of his mouth, he shall surely die. No, Nathan looked at David and said, David, thou art the man. David said, I have sinned. Now listen to me carefully. He said, I have sinned. David didn't fuss at him. David didn't argue with him. David didn't get mad. And this is one of the reasons David's a man after God's own heart. You learn so much from David here. And old Nathan said, God has forgiven you. God's put away your sin. But nonetheless, listen to me. The sword shall never depart out of thy house. And David went through, and I kept listening this afternoon, and old Alexander Scorba kept reading, here come Tamar, here come Amnon, here come on and on, and finally finally to Absalom. He talked about Absalom, and David said, mine own son that proceeded from my own bowels seeketh my life. David had to leave Jerusalem. David, it just never It never, it never stopped. Now you listen to me tonight. This is the man who wrote this psalm. His anger doesn't endure forever. That he pitieth us as the father pitieth his children. That his mercy is new. You better grab hold of it. Going to need her someday. He said as far as the east is from the west, so hath he removed our transgressions from us. He hath not dealt with us according to our iniquities, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities, and so forth. Here's a guy who wasn't just writing some nice sounding folks. Let me tell you, so here's a man who experienced the mercy of God. And even though the rest of his life he reaped what he sowed, he still believed in and loved the mercy of God. Those rich men, those dogs that licked the rise, were there a message of compassion. I don't care what you've done tonight. And may I say further, I don't know what you're going to do in the future, and you don't either. You say, I would never do such a thing. I don't think David thought he would either. But I want you to remember something. His compassions fail not. In Lamentations 3.21, where we get that song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, the Bible says, This I recall. Wow. There's some things you need to recall. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You have got to remember, dear friend, that God's going to send you a preacher along once in a while. So let me tell you something. When that old dog of yours comes up to you tonight, you're walking to the door of your house and he comes up and wants you to pet him. You just remember God's preacher's. That God is a compassionate God. You know, funny about an old dog, you can almost kick him and run him off, try to run him off, and he'll be back to house next morning. Looking up at you and wiggling his tail. Well, there's another preacher we got to run, and that's old Pilot's Rooster. Man, what a preacher. Let me tell you, the night you say, Reggie, is that true? I promise you that rooster did more preaching to Peter than anybody. Had, he had never listened to a message like he listened to that one. 
Nowhere else in scripture is it said that when he heard a message, he went out and wept bitterly. But when that rooster preached, Peter went out and wept bitterly. You know what? It's a message. Repent. Repent. Repentance is godly sorrow. Get honest with yourself. Quit playing the stupid game. Quit lying to yourself about the sin. Quit lying to yourself about the situation. Quit carving it out to suit what you want it to be. <clears throat> it tells me that Jesus knew what he was going to do before he ever did it. Peter, you're not going to stand by me to the death. You're going to walk in there and deny me three times. And that rooster is going to crow. And I'm just saying to you tonight that sometimes God sends a message, you better repent. And can I say to you the blessedness of repentance is that Peter did repent. He did repent and God used him on the day of Pentecost to preach and 2,000 people were saved because that man experienced genuine repentance. He wasn't tinkering around with God anymore playing games. Repentance will bring great results in your life. The Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. The same man who took a sword and cut, wanted to split another man's head open like a watermelon and cut his ears off. The same man who was a rugged fisherman. He walked out and wept. Peter's one of my favorite men in the New Testament. You can't never tell where he's going to be at. You know, he's always saying something he kind of, you know, shouldn't have said. But you know what? His heart was with God. Can I tell you tonight that God's heart is touched with genuine godly sorrow over our sin. Let me tell you when God will get real near to you and that's whenever the game is up and it's all over with and you quit the nonsense and you quit alibying and justifying and blaming and you say, God, I have sinned. And in your heart, there is a repulsion to it. There's a remorse over it. And you're not just sorry you got caught or you just caught up with you. You're genuinely sorry that you have sinned against God. And I'm telling you something that rooster preached to him that night. It told him, God knows your heart, Peter. God knows what's going on in your heart. It means to turn from unbelief and turn from sin. I must hurry. There's another preacher in the book of Acts and it's Herod's worms. Oh, Herod come out there and they applauded him and said, it's the voice of a God, not a man. And the Bible said he gave not the God the glory and worms ate him up. I've stood, I've been at the spot. Can you imagine all of a sudden? Worms just totally eating a man up and he drops on the spot and worms consuming his body up. Let me tell you what those worms are a preacher of. They're a preacher of God's judgment. That there comes a time in life when it's over. God didn't walk up to him and say, now, Herod, you shouldn't have done that. I'm going to give you two more chances. Can I tell you something, friend? There comes a time when it's over. And judgment is executed and the preacher is telling him and is telling us, if you want to read about them haired worms, it'll tell you something. When the judgment of God falls, it is over and there's no return. He made himself an idolater and worship making himself out to be a God. Do not make yourself a God. Do not make your children a God. Do not make anyone in this world a God for God will destroy your God's. The Bible said immediately, it wasn't later, it was then. Sin brings judgment. And the last preacher I want to bring to you tonight is this in the book of Revelation. It's the angel who was a preacher. And the Bible said in Revelation 10, 5, and 6, And the angel which I saw put one foot upon the sea and one foot upon the land and said, Time shall be no more. There is a preacher, an angel, that's telling you and I, there'll be a day when it's too late for you to be saved. The door of mercy will shut and be cut off and time will be no more. And you listen to me tonight. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that people get saved after they die or after the end of this world. The angel said, time shall be no more. The Bible said in the New Testament, now is the accepted time. Today is the day. And that preacher, that angel who stands on the sea and stands on one foot on the earth says, time shall be no more. God has some preachers, strange preachers in the Bible, doesn't he? I hope tonight that you and I will listen to them. What strange preacher is God using tonight in your life? What strange preacher has God used? It may have been a close call somewhere. It might have been something that almost happened. It might be something that you know could happen. I hope tonight you just won't remember the message of judgment and time is almost out, but I hope you remember the messages of God's faithfulness as Noah's dove. 
We need that message. We need the message of his reproof once in a while. God saying, hey, you're headed the wrong direction. You better turn around. We need that message of God's promises. I'm going to take care of you. It doesn't matter what in the world's going on. I'm able to feed you and take care of your needs. And we need that compassion. We need that message from the dogs of God's compassion. I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad God can find us and care about us. And I'll tell you what, I've had God to, I've had God to lick the sores on my soul. Amen. You know what I'm talking about? Come down and tender me and talk to me and comfort me. And then we need sometimes that old rooster crowing to make us repent. repent. And then I pray God that none of us will ever hear the message of the worms. That strange preacher who says, judgment. No space for repentance. It's over. And I pray that when that angel puts his foot on one foot on the sea and one on the land and says, time shall be no more, that every person in this building under the sound of my voice will be able to say, I'm under the blood of the lamb. I've taken care of eternity by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's stand together tonight. I'd like you to have a word of prayer with somebody next to you and uh, just pray. Ask God to help you hear the preachers. Some, just pray one with another and ask God to help you hear the preachers.